This video is brought to you by Craven's Comic Books and Collectibles. Check out their weekly live show auction and sale at facebook.com slash Craven's Comics every Sunday night at 9 p.m. Eastern. And you can check out their inventory at cravenscomics.com. Craven's Comics, for the comics you crave. Please welcome to the program Kelly McCormack. What up, what up, what up, what up. Nice to How see you me? again, hear you. Yeah. See nice you. to see, nice to hear you see you. Uh, it's if been you a touch long the time. screen, I don't know. <laughs> hey James. <laughs> Hi Kelly, how are you? I am I am great. Remember last time we saw each other, we were in the hallway. Yes, yeah. that's convention? right. Yes, of a fan run convention, Unplugged Expo, back in the fall of 2019. Yeah, the, the before times. The before times, and then before the before times, before that was on stage with Tom Allison at Bad Dog Theater, I think. Again. Yep. Close. Comedy Close. bar. Comedy, Comedy bar. bar. Right. That's like, right, right, that's right. basically about three blocks difference right there. Sorry, I, I don't remember <laughs> what happens on streets, what, what places I used to go to. What it's my old quite home. all right because it was in the middle of a freaking snowstorm and it was awesome that you came out for it. So. Oh, man. Anything yeah. for you guys. I was... I was sitting in the waiting room looking at your like the they'll let you in in a second and it says episode 567 dash 200,000 <laughs> well the 200,000 that's that's part of the date uh yeah. <laughs> I know I know I know but I was just enjoying the idea that you guys had done 200,000 <laughs> it sometimes feels like it it definitely does especially after yeah. this past year and yeah you know, which has felt like 400. So well, now it's like the show that never ends. I feel like I'm always sitting in front of this screen talking to someone on Zoom. I know, right? Ah, <laughs> <laughs> oh, guys. Oh, so nice man. to see you guys. So Here nice you guys. to see you too. Definitely. <laughs> now, of course, the last time we did see you, uh, you had just locked picture mm. on the film we're talking about tonight, Sugar Daddy, mm -hmm. um, a film that, uh, you know, covers the commodification of sex, not just in the realms of sex, but also music, in entertainment, uh, and pretty much just actual like male female uh, interactions. This yeah. is a, this is a very uh, deep film that's all about the journey. Like yeah. it's really amazing seeing this character go through this extremely, um, you know, painful journey that's extremely realistic. And I know that when you put the script together, you did, I want to say, 78 drafts. Sure the did. <laughs> so yep. what was it like to go through that long journey of making the script what you needed to be and then going through the journey of actually making the film? Mm -hmm. Good question. Well, I wrote the first draft in a dead heat in a cabin fever-esque state in my apartment over the course of three months. But then the 78 drafts happened over the course of five years um, with the involvement of my two incredibly creative producers, Lauren Grant and Lori Lazinski and director Wendy Morgan. And um, we just kept chipping away at it because we were having a hard time finding financing because as you said, it's a very complicated film. It's very provocative. It makes people kind of uncomfortable. So um, approaching, typically older male gatekeepers in the financing world for the film was really difficult. So we had all this time to kind of continue to, to, to mine every moment for its exchanges. So as you said, it's, it's the commodification of the performative femininity and female sexuality in all forms with her roommate, with her boss, with her catering job, with her friends, with, you know, and, and the more overt moments of commodified sex that she experiences as a sugar baby sort of take like a backseat to the more um or the le the more disquieting moments of commodified uh sexuality in the music industry as well so it was really it took a lot like it, it, it once you once your rule is that every single moment becomes a landmine and becomes an opportunity then it means that you can't let any moment in the script pass by without it being another turn of the crank. I mean, when I watch the film now, um, and I don't want to watch the film now because I've seen it 700 million times sitting through 10 weeks of the edit and the sound mix and the color design and all of that. Uh, but it is still shocking how unrelenting it is. Like it's like it's mm -hmm. like it's just like it's just 
it just, mm-hmm. it just, mm-hmm. it just does, it just doesn't ask for that. But I also don't apologize for that. Uh, it's, um, I really just wanted to burn shit down and I think we did. And, uh, yeah, so the process was, was arduous, but thank you for picking up on all the things you're, you're saying. Yeah. I was going to say is like, why, as, as you, as you mentioned it, as watching it, it, it's like a juggernaut of, uh, uncomfortability at times that is like this runaway freight train and uh like there's the, the the one of the scenes that really stuck out is the 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 friends and the confrontation that d has with all of her friends about her status uh, you know her current occupation as a, as a sugar baby and i i was watching and I, as i was watching it i kept thinking about uh how many times I've been in conversations, not about that specific subject, but are very similar in how tonally, how like the, the group breaks down into that kind of dynamic of accusatory and understanding and confusion and all those things. When you're putting like that kind of scene together, I, I got to imagine not only writing it, but also performing it, that it can be difficult to, to, to go through a scene like that. Yeah. I mean, okay. So that scene for me was harder to edit than it was to write. It was uh, oh, okay. because I come from a because I come from a, a theater background. I, I love big dinner scenes. I love when everyone's on stage and all the opinions are spit firing and folding over on top of each other. And I'm a big fan of um, the type of dialogue that you find in Robert Altman films, where you you know, one conversation starts here and then it triggers something else and then here, 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 here. So I think because coming from theater, I just sat in my apartment and sort of just acted out all these characters and improvised with myself. And it really poured out of me in a way that I think some of the other scenes um, were a little more delicate. This one felt like it was me uh, really following the muse on that thing. So it is, it is definitely the big show-stopping scene in the film. It's the turning point. It's exactly halfway through the film. It was what we imagined to be, um, you know, the if, if you're following like script analysis and you know typical Hollywood turning point esque page numbers. It is our turning point, and I, I, I thought it was really neat that that the turning point for this film was a bunch of women talking. And you'll you'll notice that Darren sort of disappears from the scene, and so do all the men. And it's really about hanging Darren's privilege out to dry and hearing all these varying opinions that she couldn't have considered because she's not from that perspective. And uh, I just wanted it to feel like an absolute shit show. And it, it was 14 pages long. And uh, I kept saying to my producers and like some financiers who were like, you have to cut this scene down. Like you can't, my producers were on board with it, but some people would be like, you can't have a 14. I'm, I'm, People can't hear this, but I'm miming smoking a cigar right now as I say <laughs> I'm sure you could tell from my voice, but like they were like, you can't have a 14 page scene in the middle of a film. Um, but I knew that it would be cut down to about two minutes. So that scene took um, two and a half weeks to edit with our incredible editor, uh, Christine Armstrong, who's nominated for a CSA for her work. Um, awesome. So yeah. yeah. That's, but, well, I, I got to say with that scene though, of course, Jess Salguero kicks things off with a uh, contrarian an opinion, which starts the things getting going. And I got to say, it's great to watch your and Jess, Jess's careers in the sense that you guys have been rival hockey players, you've been <laughs> rival curlers, and now in a dramatic film, she is the first real contrarian opinion to your character. You guys have this amazing energy as like opposite numbers in film and TV. I know. It's so funny. I keep telling her, I'm like, we've just established ourselves a very specific Canadian niche, which, which is just bitches on ice. <laughs> <laughs> and and uh, it's funny because she auditioned for um, the Maya character, the one that talks about the blow away. But I had written that character for my best friend, Mara, very uncreative in the name changes, just Mara to Maya. And uh, Mara was costume designing the film and we weren't sure whether or not she'd be able to sort of um, manage both positions, but it just became clear that she had to play it because I had written it for her voice. And then, so Jess auditioned for 
that character. But then I was like, I got to get Jess in this film. She's like my homie, my friend, like I need to have her in the film. And then when I cast her as Angela, I was like, all right, Jess, we're just like, <laughs> and now, and now we will only, we're such close friends and our, we, all we talk about is like, um, she's such a sensitive, kind, thoughtful, like Zen human being. And all we talk about is like meditation and like life goals <laughs> you know, on camera. We're always like, F you, F you, F you. Yeah. Um, yeah, it was very fun. I hope that Letterkenny fans find this film and enjoy that plucky uh, face off. That's well, not on ice. It's hilarious. Cause like uh, the, you guys uh, appearance in Carter, we talked to Christian Brun about that and he said, they have to do every sport. We need to see them fight in every sport. <laughs> well, I'm 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 in another show now where I'm I play a baseball player. Right. And I was telling, I was actually chatting with Jess, and I was like, "Yo, what's your uh, what's your American visa status status right now? <laughs> Maybe I can pull some strings." Because I was like, "Hey, hey, can you work in America right now? Like, come on, let's get you down here." And I'm like, "Can you play baseball?" I got to say, that's a really nice way of saying, I'm in a baseball show now. It's only a league of their own. Like, come on. I'm only in like the baseball show based on the baseball movie. But they... <laughs> Listen, I'm trying to be, I mean, it hasn't happened. We shot the pilot right yeah. before the pandemic and then it got picked up and it's just been, we've just been pushing it because of the pandemic. So it doesn't feel like real life yet, but mm. um it probably will happen. <laughs> this is like, I'm living in the woods right now. My whole career right now feels like fake news. I don't even know. It all feels, <laughs> it all feels very abstract. Someone's like, you're releasing a film right now. I'm like, am I? I just took out the compost and tried to avoid some bears. That's what my life is right now. I was going to say, I, I saw the trees and the bright sunshine behind you. And I was like, this is not the, uh, the, the dreariness that we are experiencing here in the, in the GTA. So, you know, like I'm, I'm jealous of you right now that you've got uh, such beautiful weather around you. Yeah. I'm, I feel bad and I really shouldn't draw attention to it because I know Ontario is just not a good place. I, mm -hmm. I escaped Los Angeles in March and then I escaped Ontario in May of last year. So I've been, I'm from Vancouver. So I've just been living with my mom in the woods. So that's been great. But um, yeah, I, it's, uh, it's all a mess. It's just all a mess, guys. It's all a mess. I, I can't even, I think today I saw on Twitter that Ontario is dying was like trending. Like that's what was trending on Twitter today. I was like, great. That's not a good update. No, no, definitely not I, a good update. No, it's, it's, it's not a hundred percent accurate, but it's also not a hundred percent wrong. Yeah. So. They're not wrong. They're not wrong. Definitely not. Uh, we got an email in from uh, Claudette J who writes, Kelly is such a talent. I love her work and what a film. Wow. So realistic and true. You go girl. Excellent. Woohoo. Well, thank you for that email. I forgot that you guys get emails. I love yeah. this. Yes. I love when we're missing a, we didn't get to do any like Q and A's for the festivals because of this. So I miss the audience reaction. So thank you for Good. watching the boom and got, uh, calling it real. Cause that's what I fought for. There you go. We got another email in from John R who says, hi, this movie sounds very interesting. Where is it, where is it available right now? Good question. That's a good question. I'm going to answer. Um, it's available anywhere you buy and rent your film. So it's not on a platform. It's not streaming yet. Hopefully it will be one day. But at the moment, it's on like your iTunes, Google Play, Apple TV. Shall I go on? I don't know. I'm really bad at this part. But it's basically any video on demand. Uh, yeah. 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 Anywhere you can rent it. Definitely. Yeah, I'm, I'm like not the person who knows these things of the crew, but I know it's that, what you just said. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. Now, um, I heard that uh, you, you mentioned earlier about how you originally wrote this script in a fever. And yeah. I heard that that fever script writing came after a Slim Jim commercial. Oh, God. <laughs> it's so funny because I, I mentioned this a long time ago, and it's one of those little anecdotes that keeps on getting, like, picked up, whatever. But yes, it, it basically, I was working as a caterer, as a dental receptionist. I was working in retail, selling candles, and I was a babysitter, and I was auditioning for 
commercials and I hadn't booked any like major film anything yet um and I was trying to think of how to quit all those jobs so that I could actually have the time to to write because I didn't have that I was working like something stupid like 16 hour days or something um and then I booked this Slim Jims commercial, which never aired, thank goodness. And uh, it pays like commercials, um, they pay, well, they paid me like $2,000, which in this uh, version of my life where I was at, that was like, I could live off of two grand for months. I was like, copy, I could live off of two grand for three months. So I booked the Slim Jim commercial. I ate a bunch of meat sticks on camera and spat them into a bowl. They paid me $2,000. I quit my jobs, wrote this film, and now who's laughing? Slim Jims. That's, that's, the- <laughs> that's awesome. It's funny because, yeah, when I heard that, I was like, wow, the only person I could ever think of who did a Slim Jim commercial was Randy Savage. So <laughs> It didn't air, which is, uh, it didn't, which is fine. Actually, it wasn't fine at the time because mm. it was supposed to air in the States, which gives you a lot of residuals. So I was like, I've hit pay dirt here. This is great. Mm. I'm going to be able to survive. So I think I've forgotten about this. I blocked this out of my memory until this very moment. But yes, it was supposed to air in the States. It didn't air in the States. So I had thought that I could afford to quit all my jobs. And then it, um, it got canned. So mm. apparently I wasn't very good at eating meat sticks on camera. So <laughs> Way to go, Andrew. Way to, way to bring the interview down to a, you know, okay, crashing I'm going gonna, gonna to spin it back around. I'm going to spin it back around. <laughs> I was going to say, I'm like, you're just, you're just crushing two, all of us. I here. got two ways I can save this green and I'm going to go with the, uh, the more obscure one. Okay. You go know, for it. You know, you are, you're an artist. You're always working with new ideas. And I hear that one of the ideas you want to work on is something with puppets. Oh no! Wow, you guys have really scoured the internet for these deep teas. Um, wow, I'm so happy we're talking about puppetry instead of meat sticks because puppetry yeah. is my favorite thing. Um, yes, I'm so impressed that you know this. I'm trying to rack my brain for who I talked about with, about puppetry with recently. Um, yes, uh, some of the most, I mean, people don't know this. Some people know this about me, but um, when I get asked like, what films did you grow up on? And like, what's your greatest inspiration or why'd you become a filmmaker? And I was like, well, I never had an interest in becoming a filmmaker. I just wanted to be a theater nerd. I just wanted to be on Broadway and move to New York and do experimental theater and Sondheim musicals and call it a day. Um, Because I grew up as as we've talked about with like super nerds in the family, we just used television for Chrono Trigger and Final Fantasy VII and Xenogears and like, Final Fantasy Tactics and all the stuff and like Spider-Man and, you know, um, Donkey Kong Country 3. Like that's what we used the television for. So we never really mm-hmm. watched movies, but I did watch The Labyrinth, which is probably my favorite feminist films of all times. And like, it was my formative. So The, the Labyrinth, The Dark Crystal, all the Jim Henson films, Wizard, Legend. And uh, it became written on my DNA. So as I've been... Uh, working as a filmmaker and making projects happen, I've been slowly trying to make puppetry happen again. (laughs) (laughs) And uh, my um, like artistic partner, uh, Mara Ziegler, who's the costume designer on the film, she used to be a puppet, a puppetist, a puppet, puppetist? I should probably know how to say this. (laughs) A puppetist, what's the word? Puppeteer? Puppeteer! I was like, guys. (laughs) No, I love puppetists. That's, we're gonna call it a puppetist from now on. (laughs) <laughs> sorry i'm just like you you mentioned puppetry and now i'm firing on all cylinders um <laughs> puppetry yeah so she used to work as a um puppeteer and uh her and i have been scheming how to make how to make a uh move our careers into puppetry again um i don't i know that it's not like i don't know if there's an audience for it i, I don't know how well the dark crystal netflix uh reboot did if it did at all. Uh, but um, I would like to work with some practicals in, in the world of um, the, the sparkly fantasy space of Jim Henson and, and sort of tap into some of those more um, ethereal, nonlinear for children, but for adults too sort of thing. But, you know, I also have like a Fellini film I'm working on that's very like Italian. And I have a sci-fi film I'm writing, which is probably my next film and a TV show about a female gang. So I'm sort of all over the place, but yes, puppetry or puppeteers (laughs) are in there. 
puppetist. A puppetist. <laughs> I'd like to become a pup. I'd like to become a puppetist, please. My <laughs> Oh, the 1940s producer is back. Awesome. I love the fact that you're bringing a character to the show. This is good. Oh, man. <laughs> this is why we love you so much, right? That's like, right. it's, yeah. I, you know, and, and honestly, the idea of uh, you guys working on a, a puppet based project, the idea behind one, I, yeah, any, any, any genre, I'd be okay. Any genre, doesn't matter. I'll check it mm -hmm. out. Cause, yeah, well, good. yeah, I, I think, uh, I think a feminist based, female based, or, you know, what's exciting about puppets to me is that they're, they are genderless. They are, so I can investigate questions of gender and questions of performative gender and things you can't do with human beings. So there is such a uh, beautiful freedom there. And I'm hoping that it will be not just irreverent, but, and, you know, fun, but also dark and schemy and bizarre. And, you know, like some of those old puppet puppetry films with puppeteers, um, they're really weird. And I love, and I, and I kind of grew up watching that kind of bizarre seventies sci-fi puppetry space. And I, I love the aesthetic. That's awesome. Yeah. We got an email in from P Risen who says, uh, can't wait to see Kelly's film. Secondly, Night in Paradise, which is the film we're, we're reviewing tonight. Genius. Excellent. A 10 all the way. Hey, I was barbecuing this weekend and thought about Mr. Green's tasty meats. <laughs> Wish we had them. Don't we all? Don't we all? Coming soon. Sometime. Yes. He's been indoors for so long. He's decided he's going to make his uh, meat restaurant uh, happen. It's going to happen. We're talking, about, we're talking about meat again. This is triggering. <laughs> Okay. Okay. Well, before I don't, we go, I don't want to trigger you. So I apologize, know. you know, on behalf of everybody who's listening, you know, we're no more meat talk, no, no more meat, meat talk. talk, especially in stick form. No, no. <laughs> no meat sticks, no meats on a stick, no shish kebabs, no yeah. kebabs of any kind, no kebabs of any kind. We're going to stay away from that. Now we're going to do the kale episode. Uh, <laughs> we're going to talk just about kale. All right. <laughs> I'll be back. <laughs> yeah, no, but Kelly, uh, I want to I wanna thank you for coming on the program. The film just, it was an amazing experience to watch it. Like, mm. like, as you said, there's the moments of, you know, you make the audience feel uncomfortable. I love the fact that this film takes those risks and actually takes the audience to the point where they actually have to ask themselves questions. Those are the best kind of films. Well, that's the biggest compliment because early on, I just said, I want people to come out of the theater arguing and breaking up with each other. <laughs> and, <laughs> and, and just like, you know, I want to overhear it. So, you know, I, I'm really grateful that we got to shoot this film because I know a lot of films because of COVID have been like canceled. So I feel very, very lucky, even though we aren't exhibitioning it in a theater, but I will allow myself a little bit of sadness to not be able to overhear the arguments out of the theater, which is what I just want to make movies that raise questions and not and not answers and, and never give anything in a in a pretty bow, even my puppetry work. So uh, <laughs> thank you for um, for supporting it and feeling the way you do about it. It really means a lot. Excellent. You know, I, I'm going to say this now to everybody who's listening, uh, who may listen to this into the future. Uh, what I would suggest is go watch Sugar Daddy and then record you and your uh, whoever's watching it with you. And then post it on Twitter or something so that and, and tag Kelly in it so that she could hear it. And that would be it'd be perfect. Yes. Oh, hashtag great. hashtag sugar daddy movie. Hashtag the great debate. There we go. <laughs> yes, thank you. Oh wow. Right. Kelly, have yourself a great day. Yes, you too, guys. Lovely seeing you guys as always. Until next time. Until episode right. three hundred thousand and five. <laughs> yes. <laughs> That'll be the kale episode, definitely. <laughs> okay. 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 okay, see ya. See ya Bye. later. <laughs> Goodbye, producer. <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>